it's a very broad topic. So your interest may be, uh, you know, around managing the people as part of the innovation process, or you may be more interested in some of the, the more commercial and business aspects uh, of innovation. We'll touch on um, issues that relate to all of those, uh, but in particular, I'm going to talk about uh, four things. So I'll go to my next slide. Uh, I'm first going to talk about why innovation is important and critical to growth and survival. And I mean, of course, business growth and survival. Uh, but also what I wanted to talk about there is, is to first of all set a definition of innovation so that we all understand the, the kind of common definition, what we're talking about, and then I'll, I'll talk more about why it's important. Uh, I'm also talking about why it's important, uh, not just from a commercial point of view, but really for any organization. So, so I'm going to say organization rather than business because I, I also include in the discussion uh, organizations that are not-for-profit organizations. So that can include government departments uh, and other sorts of organizations whose primary purpose is not to make money, but is to deliver services to, to uh, clients and, and stakeholders. The second thing that I'll talk about then is the individual and organizational parameters that are uh, important to innovation success. Uh, and well, I, I won't uh, kind of preempt myself, but I'll obviously talk about things that relate to individual people, as well as some parameters uh, or factors that relate to the organization and how people and organizations go about uh, engaging in this process of innovation. The third point that I'll talk about is the tools and processes to support organizational innovation. And then the fourth point is how is organizational innovation measured and improved? Now, of course, the other difficulty with a topic like innovation is that it's a big topic. It's a very complex thing. And so, of course, in one presentation, we can't hope to cover all of these things in detail. So the purpose of this presentation today is to begin to, to give you some of the, the terminology and the vocabulary of innovation and to kind of draw your attention to the things that are important for understanding and managing organizational innovation. But of course, you'll after this probably want to, to sort of explore the topic further and find out more. And I've got some uh, tips and information about that as well at the end of the presentation. So moving straight on, the first thing that I want to do, uh, even before I tell you about why innovation is important, as I said first, is to explain what it is. Where does innovation come from and why do organizations try to innovate? And I believe that uh, the discussion here begins with the idea of change. And so I'll, you'll see the, the uh, terms and things appear on the screen as I build through this. So when I say change, I mean that the change can be anything from climate change, and of course that's an important topic uh, in the world today. It can be things like health change, for example, when uh, people and countries experience a, you know, a, a health problem or a new disease. Uh, it can be social change, and that can be, for example, uh, in my own country in Australia, a particular issue uh, that's becoming important is that the population is getting older. So we're not having as many children as we should to, to replace people as they become older. And so the, the average age of the population is shifting. And the reason that's important, of course, is that fewer people are working, more people are retired. So that represents a change for society. And another example of change is financial change. Of course, five or six years ago, we had the, the global financial crisis. So there's a good example of a financial change. Now, changes of the kinds that I've just described do one of two things, and you'll see how this builds towards innovation in a moment. So one of the things that happens when changes occur is that those changes lead to what we can call market pull. Now, another way to think of market pull is customer demands. So think in particular of the example of climate change, and one of the, the possible things that that leads to in terms of customer demands is people, for example, want cleaner cars. They want cars that don't emit as much carbon dioxide that are better for the environment. Uh, or in the case of a health change, 
people have expectations about new medicines and, and new treatments for diseases to improve their life. Uh, social change can include things like a desire, a customer demand for better education, and in economic terms, changes can drive things like demands for greater wealth. So you can see that changes on the one hand lead to new customer demands, things that people want, and all of those things are, well, I've given some examples there. Now, really what those uh, customer demands do is that they define something. They define a set of new problems that organizations have to deal with. So in the case of the, the customer demand for, for better cars or cleaner cars with lower emissions, the real problem that an organization is trying to deal with is how to reduce carbon emissions from a car. Or in the case of an economic change, it might be how do I reduce the amount of tax that I pay to, to increase my own personal wealth. So changes lead to market pool. Market pool defines new problems that have to be solved. Now, on the other hand, if we go back to the other side for a second, change also does something else. Change produces what's called technology push. And the way to think of this is that technology push is inventions. So, <clears throat> for example, scientists and engineers invent better kinds of batteries that can store more electricity for a, a given size of battery. Or, for example, in the past, scientists discovered gamma rays, and gamma rays or X-rays, say, can be used uh, to do certain things. Um, uh, Marconi, a famous uh, engineer from you know, about 100 years ago, discovered radio waves and how they could be used for communication. And even you know, economists have discovered in the past the idea of credit, so a financial instrument that, that can be used. All of those things represent technology push. Now, what those inventions do is that they generate new solutions. So you can probably see what's happening here is that change gives rise to two things. On the one hand, it causes new problems. On the other hand, it sometimes gives rise to new solutions. And of course, those new solutions might be things like electric vehicles or in medicine, radiotherapy, or even of course, the internet as an invention, or uh, certainly in Australia, more recently, there's this concept of reverse mortgages. So when, when a person is a young adult and they want to buy a house, they borrow money from the bank and they take out a mortgage. But now some banks are offering this service called a reverse mortgage. And when people retire, they effectively sell their house back to the bank and the, the bank pays them for that house. They let the people still live in the house, but the, the, the individual people then have an income from the bank. So what happens, of course, is that we need to connect those new solutions and new problems together because new problems require solutions and solutions need to solve a problem. So there's a connection between those two things. And I've highlighted the word new in particular because that's, that's especially important to the discussion of innovation. Now, there's a very, another important element in this, this loop here, and that is organizations, because it's organizations that connect those new solutions and new problems together. So organizations play an important part in closing this loop and joining new solutions to uh, new problems, and therefore enable organizations to respond to change. And another word for this whole loop, this process of connecting new problems to new solutions is in fact innovation. So the first and most important thing for us to understand together is what innovation is. And innovation, very simply, is that process of connecting new problems to new solutions. And as I said, the word new there is very important because innovation is not concerned with old things that have been used in the past. It's concerned in particular with new things, new things, new solutions and new problems. So that's our definition, and that also begins to hint to us why innovation is important. But just to summarize that then, uh, innovation fundamentally, as far as an organization is concerned, is this process of connecting new problems to new solutions. Another way to think of that is that innovation is about generating effective and novel solutions. So it's the process of actually coming up with solutions that are both new and that also serve some particular purpose. They work and they do what they're supposed to do. So that's innovation. Now, why is it important? 
Well, there are several different ways of looking at the importance of innovation. Some of these are, are more relevant to organizations and businesses. Some are also important to whole countries, and it's why governments around the world are interested in innovation as well, not just companies, but governments, because governments know that innovation plays an important role in the economy and the, the, uh, the sort of economic security of countries around the world. So one explanation for why innovation is important is shown in this diagram here. Now, it relates to what I was saying earlier, because you can see uh, on the two axes, on the horizontal axis at the bottom here, we've got problems, and those problems can be old or they can be new. And just a moment ago, I mentioned that we were particularly concerned with new problems. On the vertical axis up here, we've also got old solutions and new solutions. And again, a moment ago, I said that we were particularly concerned with new solutions. So I'll talk about new solutions and new problems in a second, but to help illustrate why innovation is important, I want you to think first of all about what would happen if we tried to solve new problems with old solutions. In other words, this quadrant here in my diagram where I've labeled it stagnation. Now, what this is telling us is that when a new problem is identified, and let's take the example of, of pollution. We all know that climate change seems to be occurring and that, that one of the reasons it's occurring is because of the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So there's a new problem. It's a problem that hasn't existed until very recently. And one, one of the approaches that we could take to try and solve that problem would be to say, well, how about uh, to solve the problem of emissions of carbon dioxide from, for example, from coal-fired power stations, then why don't we build more coal-fired power stations? Now, the illustration there is that we're applying an old solution, coal-fired power stations, to a new problem, this problem of climate change. Now, you, you don't need me to tell you that that's a silly idea because it's coal-fired power stations, for example, that's been causing the problem. So if we were to try and solve that problem by building more coal-fired power stations, all we're doing is taking an old solution and trying to make it solve a new problem, but we know that it never will. So in, in simple terms, the solution to something like climate change is not to create more pollution. That would be applying an old solution to a new problem, and that's why I've labeled this quadrant stagnation. So that begins to tell us why innovation is important, because if innovation is about new things, then straight away we can see that if we try to tackle innovation or tackle problems with old things, old solutions, it's not going to work. So again, we begin to see the importance of innovation is that it's necessary to solve new problems. Uh, now, so one of the reasons why innovation is important is that without innovation, we can't solve the problems that are occurring in the world, whether they're climate change or economic change or financial change or whatever it happens to be. The second reason why uh, innovation is important uh, is if we begin to look at this uh, quadrant here on the top left. Now, I'm, I'm going to ignore the bottom quadrant on the left completely because that's dealing with old solutions and old problems. And we know that, that when we're dealing with old things, uh, that's not innovation and innovation is not necessary there. So we can kind of basically leave that, that bottom corner out of the question. So the second reason why innovation is important is that even when we're dealing with old problems, we can actually make them better. So when we apply a new solution, to an old problem, this quadrant I've labeled incrementation here, then that gives a second reason why innovation is important. Now, why would anybody want to apply a new solution to an old problem? Well, the answer is simple. It's that when we're competing with other organizations. So if the old problem, for example, is, I don't know, let's say, how do we provide uh, computing services to people? So there's an existing, what we could call an old problem. but there's lots of companies around the world that make computers that are all competing for a certain size of market. So if all we're doing is the same as everybody else, then it's very hard to win a share of that market. And so there is the second reason for innovating. 
the one way that we can differentiate ourselves from other organizations also solving the same problem is to introduce new solutions. In other words, to make the solutions better or make them faster or make them cheaper, but to differentiate them in some way. And that means to do that, we have to introduce something new. So once again, as soon as new comes into this equation, whether it's a new solution or a new problem, that's where we begin to see the importance of innovation. So the second reason why innovation is important is to help us stay competitive. And we do that by introducing new solutions to old problems. And then the, the third reason why we innovate is really has two explanations. And they're kind of things that I've already talked about because uh, up in the top right hand corner here, you can see two familiar terms, technology push and market pull. So this top right hand quadrant here is really the ultimate reason why innovation is important. And that comes back to this idea that if we have new problems and if we have new solutions, then we have two possibilities. We either have this idea of market pull of new customer demands. So it's kind of starting from the bottom down here with a new problem and then going across to a new solution. So one way of, of dealing uh, with a new problem is to find a new solution. And that's a case of market pull or what I call reinitiation. When we start with the new technology or the new solution, then it's like we're, we're starting from the top left here with the new solution, moving across here to the technology push and then down to solving a new problem. So that gives us the other two reasons why we innovate. When we're dealing with technology push, when we start with new solutions, the reason we innovate is to create new markets and to stay competitive, to grow our business by creating new markets for the technologies that we've developed. And the final reason that we innovate and why it's important is the one I've already mentioned a few times, that when we have new problems, when we start with new problems, then the only viable way that we can solve those is by finding new solutions. So the fourth reason is innovation is important because it's the only way to meet these ever-changing needs of society. Okay, now there are a couple of other uh, explanations for why innovation is important. And I'm, I'm going to this in, in some detail because I think, uh, well, this sets the scene for any discussion about innovation. And it also will lead us into very nicely into looking at some of the individual and organizational factors that affect innovation. So I hope, I hope it's making sense and, uh, and I'm still coming through loud and clear. So another reason that we, why we innovate uh, which is perhaps more, more business related uh, is what I'll explain here. Now, um, certainly in my country, um, in Australia, farming is very important, of course, and we, we grow a lot of grain, we, grow, we, we raise a lot of sheep uh, and things like that. And uh, there's a very a classic example of a phenomenon called the law of diminishing returns which helps to explain innovation as well. And I'll, I'll build up the picture as we go and explain this. So imagine that if you're a farmer and you're growing a crop, uh, you want to be competitive as a farmer. You want to increase the amount of crop yield that you get, the amount of grain that you produce, because by doing that, you, you make more money. And so that ensures your growth and survival as a farmer. Now, farmers learned thousands of years ago that one way they can increase their crop yield is to add fertilizer to the crop. So some sort of chemicals or natural chemicals or even uh, you know, manure from animals to help the crop grow better. And what that does is that up to a point, the more fertilizer that we add, the more we increase our crop yield. So there's a way of, of getting more value out of what we do by, by adding something, in this case, the fertilizer. But the law of diminishing returns tells us that we can't do that forever because at some point, if we keep adding fertilizer to the crop, then the, the increase in the yield of the crop begins to slow down. And you can see why. It's because if we keep adding more and more fertilizer, uh, the, the crop can only absorb so much. So we begin to kind of put on an excess that's not needed. And so what you often see is that with the amount of fertilizer increasing, the crop yield starts to, to tail off and it stops increasing. And that's, uh, sorry, if I go back one step, uh, around where these orange arrows are, that's known as the point of diminishing returns, where the, the 
output begins to actually uh, kind of tail off. We can even have a point of negative returns indicated by this red arrow where if we keep adding fertilizer to the crop, we can actually kill the crop by adding too much and then the crop yield actually starts to decrease. Now, what's that got to do with innovation? Well, I'll show you on the next slide. Because again, if you're a farmer or this, this works in, in most other systems that we deal with, uh, then this concept of increasing yields or increasing output, but, but the, the danger of diminishing and negative returns plays a role in innovation as well. So that's that point of diminishing returns and there's the point of negative re returns. So I'll show you the connection to innovation now on a, a fresh slide. Uh, if we're a farmer and we want to avoid this point of diminishing returns, in other words, if we want to keep increasing our crop yield, but we know that by simply putting more and more fertilizer on the crop will kill the crop, then we've got to find some other way of getting around that problem of diminishing returns. So imagine again that we've got our fertilizer curve, but we're a smart farmer now, so we know that there's no point in putting more and more fertilizer on because it'll, uh, the crop yield will start to decrease. So we try something else. Now in the case of a farmer, it might be that you say, well, okay, I'll put on only as much fertilizer as keeps me in that green arrow. And then when I reach that point where I know the curve will start to flatten off, that point of diminishing returns, that's the point at which I have to do something else. And what is that point? Well, for, in our terminology, it's where we have to introduce innovation. In other words, thinking back to what we said earlier, it's the point where we have to introduce a new solution because the old solution, fertilizer, is no longer working. So farmers have to innovate. And what might that innovation be? That new solution could be irrigating the crop. So putting more water on the crop or watering it artificially instead of just waiting for, for you know, rainfall. And so the farmer might say, well, I'm going to innovate. I'm going to introduce a new solution to this problem of diminishing returns. And I'm going to solve that problem with an innovation, a new solution. But then the farmer also knows that that innovation only works for so long before it also starts to diminish. So the smart farmer says, well, I have to innovate again at that second point of diminishing returns. Instead of just putting more and more water on the crop, I have to introduce a new solution. And that new solution might be the way that you put the seeds in the ground. I know that some of my colleagues here at the University of South Australia do research in farming. And, and some of the research they do is that there is, the, you know, there's a good place to put the seed in the ground in terms of how deep you put it in the ground. If you put it too deep, it doesn't grow as well. If you put it too near the surface, it can blow away. So there's a perfect depth for a seed to go when you're planting a crop. And they do research to, to understand you know, exactly what that is. And then they try to build new farm machinery that can put the seed in exactly the right place. So that's another innovation that's solving the problem again. It's, it's, it's taking that problem of how do I increase my crop yield? And every time the old solution starts to diminish, we introduce a new solution. And you can see what's happening is that by a succession of innovations, of new solutions applied each time we reach that point of diminishing returns, we add another new solution, then we can keep the crop yield going up and up and up for as long as we like, provided we keep innovating. So the, the, going back to our original question of why is innovation important? Well, this, this shows you in, in very sort of graphical terms what innovation can do for you. Now, it doesn't have to be farming, of course. It can be uh, you know, an industrial process uh, or mining or you know, any kind of manufacturing process. The same sort of concepts apply. Uh, another good example of this is if you're building cars in a factory, uh, you, you can imagine for yourselves that if, uh, let's say that one person could build a car in one day. So you think, well, I'll put two people on there and they'll build a car in half a day. But if you kept going and said, I'll put 100 people in there and we'll build the car in you know, 10 minutes, it doesn't work because there's some point where you have too many people and they start to get in each other's way and actually slow the process down. So the same concept of diminishing returns applies in manufacturing, in, in all sorts of other processes as well. 
So in terms of why, why do we need to innovate? What's the value of innovation? Well, one reason is that it enables us to keep growing and to keep increasing our yield, even when the old solutions have, have kind of used up all their potential. And of course, this is also important in terms of competing because if you're in competition, whether it's with another farmer or another manufacturer, then the way to be the more successful farmer, the more successful manufacturer, the more successful producer is to keep your curve going upwards as steeply as possible. And about the only way that you can do that is by continuous innovation, by every time uh, your existing solution starts to diminish, you introduce a new one to keep your growth curve going in a positive direction. Okay, and there's one final explanation for why innovation is important, then I'll start to tell you more about some of the, the uh, parameters and so on that are important. The, the final reason why innovation is important applies at a kind of national level. And it's explained by this equation here, which, which it's, it's a made up equation used to illustrate this point. So you'll see what I mean in a second. In this equation, W stands for the wealth of a nation, or it could be the wealth of a company, uh, but typically something like a nation. And in the equation, P stands for the physical resources that that organization or that country possesses. So those resources include people. In the case of a country like uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, it includes oil, of course. Uh, in my own country, in Australia, it includes things like iron ore. And in, in countries around the world, sheep, wheat, other um, minerals, and even the land that we have available. So all of those things constitute the resources that a country or an organization has available to it. And then the last term in the equation is the most important one connected to innovation. T or T to the N uh, is, stands for the technology. So T Going back to our original definition of innovation, T is the solutions. And N is a multiplier, and it's the size of N that's critical in this particular discussion. Now, what this equation means is that the wealth of a nation is completely dependent on the technology that that, that country or that organization possesses. Let me put it in, <clears throat> in simple terms and, and terms that are relevant uh, for a country like Saudi Arabia. Oil is, I always tell my students here, oil is, is nothing more than a thick black liquid unless you have the technology for getting it out of the ground and if you have the technology for processing it and if you have the technology for transporting the refined oil to other places and if you have the technology for turning the oil into uh, you know, gasoline and plastics and so on and so on. So that's the critical point there, that the wealth of a country is partly determined by the resources, but even more determined by the technology that it has that turns those resources into wealth. And the better the technology the country or the organization has, the better able it is to turn its physical resources into wealth. That's why the size of N is critical there. In other words, the term T to the N in effect determines what things are physical resources. If you don't have any technology for drilling and refining oil and transporting it, then, then it doesn't matter how much oil you've got, it's not worth anything. It's only when you've got the technology as Saudi Arabia does to extract it and process it and transport it, then it becomes valuable. And N, the critical thing here, N really represents our capacity to innovate. So countries that have, or organizations that have this combination of resources and technology and a capacity to come up with new solutions, those are the organizations or the countries that can extract the most value out of innovation. So even in this sort of context, innovation is the, the critical thing. And now I can show you that more graphically here. Uh, so the three curves that you can see here represent three different values of N in that equation. And the blue curve is when N is uh, 0.5. So when N is less than one, you can see that the wealth increases only very, very slowly with increasing technology. When N is equal to one, the red curve, then the wealth increases a little bit faster 
but still fairly slowly. And remember that N is the capacity to innovate. So in other words, when a country or an organization's capacity to innovate is quite low, then its wealth is correspondingly low. But the moment N starts to get a little bit bigger than one and, and grow, then we see what happens with the wealth. We get this green curve just for, for when N is equal to two. You can see how much greater and how much more rapidly the wealth of the organization or nation increases uh, thanks to, to that equation. So this also highlights the fact that if N is our capacity to innovate, then the greater our capacity to innovate, the greater and a disproportionately greater return we get in terms of, of the wealth of the organization or the nation. So once again, innovation is extremely important to organizations and countries because of its relationship to their ability to generate wealth uh, as a result of the resources that they have. And we might call uh, the first couple of curves, going back to an earlier graph, uh, you know, if, if all we can do is, is kind of copy other technology, then that's replication and we're, we're working on those two lower curves. But it's when we have the ability to, to incrementally improve things or even to create completely new or disruptive solutions, disruptive innovation, that's when we're operating on that green curve. So again, this is why innovation is so important, not just to individual organizations, but to whole countries. Okay, so that's a, a, a kind of long introduction uh, to why innovation is important, what it is, but it's very important to set the scene like that so that we can now move on to that second question, uh, which addresses this issue of why, or what parameters determine success. And I'll talk for about another 15 minutes on these, these next three questions before then opening it up uh, for some questions from you. So what, what parameters determine innovation success? Well, it's important to, to recognize that there are really four stages to the process of innovation. There are inputs, there's then the innovation process itself, and then there are outputs and outcomes. And the parameters that are important to innovation, now we can think of the outputs and outcomes as the business or the organization performance. But to, to put more familiar terms on the inputs, the inputs are really three things. The people in the organization, I'll talk about organizations only now, uh, the structures within the organization and the organizational culture. And then the process itself are the thinking tools and the methods that those organizations have. So from the point of view of innovation, the parameters that determine our ability to perform as an organization, as an innovating organization, to, to achieve this business performance, are these things here, the people, the structures, the culture, the thinking tools and methods. And those are the four things that I'm going to talk about for a few minutes. And sorry, if I go back for one second, it's also important in this model to see that, that the majority, the, the things that are really important to innovation are the inputs. So, you know, we, it's easy to measure the outputs in terms of profit and, you know, market share and things like that. But the things, they don't determine innovation. Those are only the, the signs after you've innovated that tell you whether you succeeded or not. But the things that actually determine innovation success are these inputs and the process. In other words, these things. Now, what are those, those input and process parameters? Well, uh, in, in the, the, the research literature in uh, creativity and innovation, we talk about the four P's framework. So a slightly more uh, sort of fancy way of describing those inputs and the process. The four P's being the person, the product, the process, and what we call the press. The press meaning the pressure or the press of the organizational culture or environment. So they're in, in, again, in more familiar terms, person represents the people, product represents the, the outcomes, the outputs, uh, process is the tools and methods, and press is the structure and the culture. So I'm going to talk about each one of those uh, briefly just to highlight how they affect innovation and why they're important. So the first one that we'll deal with is the person. So this is who, who does the innovation in the organization. Now the first and important point to say here is that everybody 
in the organization should be innovating and should be responsible for that process. And we know in, in great detail the kinds of things that help individual people to be more innovative. And I've listed just a few of them here. And again, I said earlier that um, it's a very detailed topic and we can't hope to cover everything uh, in today's presentation. So these are just some of the ideas. But from the point of view of the individual people in your organization, the kinds of things that determine innovation success are how open people are to new ideas. So how, how willing they are to try new things, to you know look at at things from a different point of view, or when something changes, that you know, how, how comfortable people are with that. Uh, another individual personal factor that, that uh, determines innovation success is this so-called tolerance of uncertainty. In other words, there are some people who don't like things that are uncertain or ambiguous. And there are other people who, who don't mind uncertainty. Um, and can deal with that uncertainty. So people who are innovative and able to be innovative and creative tend to be people who are comfortable with incomplete or uncertain information. So that's another important personal quality. Not surprisingly, uh, the third one that's very important to our um, ability to innovate, to be successful at innovation, is motivation. How motivated people are. And you can imagine for yourselves in your own organizations that you know if people come to work each day and they're unhappy to be there and they don't care whether the company is successful or not, then those people are not motivated and they're not going to be as effective in their job as people who are motivated, who come to work you know, excited and interested and wanting to do their best. So motivation is very important to creativity and innovation. And all of these things, I should add, are supported by uh, a lot of research evidence as well. So these are not just things that we're speculating about, but these are things where there is very solid research evidence about the connection to innovation. Uh, and a fourth one that's very important is the willingness to take risks. Now, you don't need me to tell you again that, that risk is an important element of business. And you know that, that businesses as a whole need to take risks and individuals, of course, need to be able to take risks. This is very important to innovation because there are some people and some organizations that are unwilling to take any risks at all. And the problem with that is that if you're unwilling to take risks because of the, you know, the fear of failure, then you will never try anything different. You'll never implement new solutions because you know, there's no guarantee that they'll work. So one of the, the qualities of individual people that determines innovation success is the willingness of those people to actually take some risks and to try some things where the outcome is uncertain. So willingness to take risks is very important as well. Uh, the second of the four things that determines innovation success is the process. And here, what I mean is the, the thinking processes that people employ. Uh, in innovation. And there are two core ones here. There's what's known as divergent thinking and what's known as convergent thinking. Now, the issue here is that we tend to, uh, for example, in my own discipline of engineering, we tend to train people to be very analytical and to, to kind of try to eliminate choice and uncertainty and just focus on the right answer. But the process of innovation also needs us to be able to do the reverse and to think divergently. So in the diagram here, uh, what I've illustrated is that when we're trying to be innovative and we first identify a problem or a need, then the very first thing that we need to do is to generate lots of possible solution ideas indicated by these different arrows. And it's only when we've generated those lots of ideas that we then apply, so that's divergent thinking, when we've got lots of ideas, then we can begin to analyze those and we can start to introduce rules to, to kind of eliminate some of the solutions until we have the best possible solution. But the important point about this is that you can only get to that good solution, whatever it is, by going through this process of first of all thinking divergently and then applying analysis. Uh, and the last uh, element of those four P's that's important to innovation, in fact, is partly 
at the output end of things, but I mean here literally uh, the kinds of, of ideas and solutions that we generate. And so there are four of those that I illustrate here. So when I say product uh, in innovation, the, the ideas and the solutions that we generate, I mean uh, one of four things. I mean that either it's literally a tangible product that you can hold in your hand, but innovation can also be in how we do things. So you can innovate by coming up with a new process, for example, a new way of manufacturing something. Uh, innovation can also be seen in systems. Now systems are basically more complex products. So innovations can also be represented by very complex collections of, of different hardware and software. And then finally, innovation can also be seen in things that are intangible, that you can't touch like a service. Now, a good example of this uh, is the service that a bank delivers to its customers. Now, the bank doesn't give you a, a physical product. All the bank does is say, we'll look after your money for you and you can get it out of, a, of an ATM. So they're providing a service, but they can also innovate and come up with new ideas and new solutions uh, in the form of services as well. So that's the product. Now, one of the very important things about determining success in innovation is understanding whether those products are actually innovative or not. And you remember that we talked earlier about the fact that things have to be new to be innovative. So we need to be able to assess the products that we generate, whether they're services or processes or tangible products, and decide whether they're actually new, but not just new. Uh, we also have to be able to decide whether they also do what they're supposed to do. And there are two other criteria that I've listed here. So in fact, in judging whether a product is innovative, there are four things that we need to consider. And more or less in the order that I've shown them here. First of all, so relevance and effectiveness asks, does the product do what it's supposed to do? The second question is novelty. Is it original or novel or surprising or new? The third question is also important. Uh, I label it elegance. And that's basically asking if the solution, if your product is complete, if it's fully worked out, if it's pleasing to the eye. And I'll show you an example of what I mean in a second. And then the last one, I, I label it genesis. And this is really a question of, does the product uh, kind of change our understanding of the problem? Does it help us to see things in a new way? So you can see that, that really the innovation of a product or the quality uh, of a product in terms of innovation is a combination of both newness and also effectiveness. Now, I'm getting conscious of the time and I'll speak for about five more minutes and then uh, take some questions, but, um, I'll show you uh, an example in a second about the, those characteristics of a product. The fourth thing that I need to talk about briefly uh, in terms of uh, the things that support and determine innovation success, the last one is the press, the organizational culture. Now, three of the, the things that are very important in terms of organizational cultures for determining innovation success are listed here. Probably the most important one is that people in an organization find it very difficult to be innovative if they don't have the time to do so and the appropriate place and resources. So people have got to have sufficient time to think up new ideas and solve problems. They've got to have adequate resources and that may be money, but it might also be equipment and so on. Uh, they've also got to get the kind of support, you know, active support from management. So it's very important that, that managers convey to people in the organization that it's okay to innovate. It's okay to take risks, to try and solve problems, uh, and that you'll get the support that you need if you do that. And then a, a third one that, that's even very important is that in a lot of organizations, and this relates to motivation, that an organization that's, that's a fun and enjoyable place to work also tends to be an organization that's more innovative because of the impact that has on people's motivation, and, and how motivation is uh, then linked into creativity and innovation. Okay, now uh, very uh, briefly and related to the four Ps that I've just discussed is the tools and processes. Now again, we, it's difficult to touch on uh, all of these things in great detail, so I'll just show you a couple of examples. Now, 
in uh, the research literature of creativity and innovation, uh, the tools and the processes we have to understand person exist. We have ways of measuring the things that I talked about, a person's willingness to take risks, their ability to think up ideas and so on. So measures like that exist, measures of, of a creative personality and measures of our ability to be innovative. Uh, in terms of process, I mentioned before uh, divergent thinking and convergent thinking. You've probably all heard of things like brainstorming or De Bono's six thinking hats. So there are tools and processes to support the process of innovation. In relation to uh, the press and the environment, there are also tools uh, to support how we go about thinking divergently in an organization. So how we how we engage in that process and this is uh, more about doing the right thing at the right time. Uh, there are also instruments and tests that enable us to to look at an organization and see what the culture is like. So there are ways of measuring that as well. And the last one that we just talked about, determining whether a product is innovative and so on, there are scales that enable us to do that as well and I'll show you a very quick example. So let's imagine that we're solving the problem of designing a chair for people to sit on. So customers, a new customer demand has risen. People say that old chairs are no good, they're not comfortable and so on. I want you to design me a new chair. So let's say that we design them the chair shown in this photograph here. How would we determine if that's an innovative solution? Well, we apply the four criteria that I mentioned before and that's using this a particular tool called the Creative Solution Diagnosis Scale. And that basically asks us to look at that product and say, well, first of all, is it relevant and effective? Does it do what it's supposed to do? And you can you could score that on a scale from you know one to 10, where one or maybe zero would be, it's completely not effective through to 10 saying it would be very effective. We can score its novelty. How new is that? Have you ever seen one of those, that type of chair before? So that gives us a measure of its novelty. Elegance, remember, is how well made and complete and fully worked out it is. Now that looks like a nice chair. It looks like it's well made. So it probably has quite good score for, for being elegant. And then Genesis, the paradigm shifting one. Well, that's, uh, there's an interesting thing about this chair in that it's an unusual design uh, that is unlike chairs we've seen before with four legs. This one uses a, a kind of mechanism for balancing to create a kind of comfortable chair design. So we can use this creative solution diagnosis scale to actually get a measure of how creative or how innovative a, a particular product is. And that can help us to select products as part of our innovation process. And just to explain or to illustrate uh, if, uh, if this chair is a very high scoring chair in terms of innovation, then you can see that this one probably isn't. Not only is it probably not very comfortable to sit on and it's leaning at a funny angle, but it's also in terms of elegance, you know, it's not very well made, it's falling to pieces and it's a very uh, conventional type of design. So it's not even, it doesn't really even have this quality of genesis. So you begin to see what I mean by things like elegance uh, and uh, effectiveness. So we could ask those same questions. Now uh, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. I'm again, I'm just conscious of time and I need to leave some time for questions. But the third or the last tool that we need um, for carrying out our process of innovation is an actual description of the innovation process itself. So, so that becomes a tool as well. Now this is one a uh, very common way of describing the process of innovation, which starts with idea generation and ends in commercialization. But I want to show you a, a slightly more detailed picture of that here, which combines some of the things that we've already talked about. Now this is the innovation phase model. And the reason this is an important tool for innovation managers is that it highlights, uh, well, it combines together the four Ps that I've mentioned. So it, it combines together uh, the thinking processes that we use for innovation, the personal factors like motivation, uh, willingness to take risks and uh, other factors, other feelings that people have. It combines also the nature of the product, whether it's highly creative or not creative at all. And it combines aspects of the organizational climate or press. And it does one very important thing. 
uh, there are seven stages to innovation in this model. Those are the columns. And this model recognizes that uh, if we take process as an example, that, uh, that the kind of process that's important for innovation in this yellow phase here, the generation phase, is divergent thinking. But in the next stage of innovation, this, pro this stage called illumination, convergent thinking becomes very important. So this innovation phase model is extremely important and unlike other ones, it recognizes that not everything is always good for innovation. Some things are only good for innovation at certain stages of the process. And that defines, and in fact, I'll, I'll jump ahead a couple of slides and then come back again. That defines some paradoxes, some puzzles. And what that basically means is that to understand innovation and to move to the final step of how do you measure it and improve it, you have to understand this important point that innovation rep, uh, contains a number of paradoxes. The idea that something can be both good for innovation and bad for innovation, depending on the phase that we're working in. So the secret, the third point uh, on the slide here, the secret to successful innovation management is aligning your organization so that you're doing the right things at the right time. And if I go back a couple of slides, uh, for example, to this one here, the way that you know what you should be doing at what point in the process is represented by this innovation phase model. Now, I'll, I'll finish off and then go to some questions by uh, going ahead again and, and answering one final question. If this, is, this represents this slide, how we should be doing innovation, where you know, it tells us as an innovation manager that when we're engaged in the process of idea generation, we've got to think divergently and, and certain other things. But when, for example, we're in the phase of illumination, we have to be thinking convergently. Now that we know that, we're in a better position to manage the innovation process. But what we also need to know is what is our organization good at and what is our organization not so good at across all of these boxes in this diagram? And that's the final piece in the puzzle of, of managing innovation is being able to measure an organization against this model to see where the organization has strengths and weaknesses. And that uh, is represented here. Now, what you see in this diagram is the output from uh, a measuring instrument called the Innovation Phase Assessment Instrument. And that measuring instrument is a survey tool that's based on the, the model that we were just looking at. And we use that to uh, assess organizations capacity or their alignment to the ideal conditions for innovation. In other words, it tells us whether the organization is doing the right things at the right time or not. And this particular diagram shows a, a kind of hypothetical output for a company. So the higher the number and the more green that the box is, the better the company is doing in that particular box for that particular thing. So for example, uh, in the diagram here, this box numbered 70, that's dark green, that's the generation phase and process. So what's that? what that is telling us is that this particular company is thinking divergently when they're supposed to be thinking divergently. But it also tells us uh, very importantly that in the next phase, where if you remember, they should be thinking convergently, their score is only 48 and it's reasonably red. That's telling us that they're not thinking convergently when they should be. So they're, they're well aligned to the ideal conditions in the generation phase, but they're not so well aligned in the next phase. So through using this instrument, the, in, uh, the innovation phase assessment instrument, we've got a way of actually doing a kind of diagnosis of the organization to see where their strengths and weaknesses are. And then we can uh, help the organization fix those strengths and weaknesses. For example, if they need to be better at divergent thinking, we can identify that, we can help them to be better at divergent thinking. Or if they have uh, an organizational climate, the press, that's not doing the right things at the right time, then we can also give very specific advice on how to fix that. So I, I'll, I'll sum up and then we'll go to some questions. I'm sorry, I've run a few minutes over time. That successful innovating organizations 
do something very important. They measure the right things related to people and culture and products and so on at the right time. They do the right things at the right time, and then they're in a position to make the changes that maximize their potential for innovation. So the, the, the kind of final message of the presentation is that successful innovation management depends on knowing what you're doing, being able to measure it, and then changing your organization to do the right things at the right time. Uh, now, while you're thinking for a moment about some questions, uh, one follow-up source for this uh, is the book that's shown here, which I'm one of the authors of, The Psychology of Innovation in Organizations. And there's a link, and I think you guys will, will have the slides available to you, so you can uh, follow it up. Or if you search for it on Amazon, uh, you'll see that it's available as well. The other follow-up here, you might have noticed on some of the slides, the, the little symbol I2P there. I2P Consulting, and the link there is a consultancy that in addition to working for the university, I work for uh, this little company called I2P Consulting, and that's what we do. We do this innovation measurement and uh, diagnosis and help organizations improve their, their uh, strengths and weaknesses uh, in the innovation process. Okay, so now we're, we're ready for some questions. And like I said, I, I apologize for talking a little bit too long, but I hope you found it interesting. And uh, uh, Nida, if we've got anybody with some questions now, then uh, I'll stop talking for a moment and, and let somebody else have a turn. Well, thank you, Mr. Dr. David, for a very interesting presentation. Folks, we are open for the question and answer. You can either put your question in the chat box or you can raise the hand icon available on your webinar console. So let me go ahead straight to the first question and it is how is innovation seen in the real world okay yeah uh, so it's a it's a good question and one of the i guess uh, the the question means um you know, how does how do we actually how does it manifest itself so how do we how do we see examples of innovation in the real world and and this goes back to uh, what I mentioned before about products, processes, systems, and services that, in other words, we find innovation occurring in all sorts of ways in the real world. So it's not just, you know, developing a new smartphone or a new chair, but innovation can also be seen in services that companies provide or in the way that we manufacture something or even in, in much more complex collections of people and software and hardware. So, so innovation occurs in all sorts of ways. And, and it goes back to my original definition that any situation in which we solve a problem, then the solution to the problem, whatever it is, that represents an innovation in, in kind of real world sense. Thank you, Dr. David. We have another one and it is from Ms. Fozia Firdos. The question is how innovation and creativity are related to each other. Is innovation and creativity strategic priority for an organization? Okay, so how, how are they related to each other? Yes. Uh, now I know, again, I, I kind of went over it briefly, but um, in the, the colored diagram with all the, the sort of red, blue, green, and so on, the innovation phase model, that, that shows the relationship between creativity and innovation. Creativity is basically the, the front end of innovation where we generate solution ideas. And then the, the wider innovation process is then exploiting those ideas. So innovation is a combination of both creating uh, solutions and then exploiting them. So, so creativity is, is the front end of innovation and that's really the relationship between the two. Thank you, Dr. David. Uh, we have another one, and the question is, how can we get people to think more creatively? Okay, well, that, that's also a very important question. And uh, the good news about uh, getting people to think more creatively is that it is something that you can teach people. Now, a lot of people sometimes think that, you know, you have to be born with creativity uh, because you, you can't be taught. But creativity is something that is entirely teachable. And the way we get people to think more creatively goes back to those four Ps, that we have to give them skills in divergent thinking. So we have to actually teach people that divergent thinking, thinking up lots of ideas 
is very important. But to get people to think creatively, they also have to do that. Uh, they have to, to be motivated to do it. They have to kind of feel good about doing it. They have to be supported in their organization uh, to do it and so on. So it's really a combination of those four Ps. You have to have the thinking skills, which we can teach people, but you also have to have those thinking skills supported by, uh, like I said, the right levels of motivation, the willingness to do it, uh, a boss or an organization that's supportive and so on. And, and if you bring all of those four Ps together, then you give people the best chance of thinking creatively. Thank you, Dr. David. Now let me go to another question and th that is, how much percentage wise should organizations invest from resources that is personal into BAU activities versus into innovation? Yep, uh, that, that's also a very good question. Um, a lot of organizations, use a 70-20-10 a ratio. So they, they understand that, you know, at the end of the day, every business has got to make some money to stay in business. And if all we did was, was try to innovate constantly, then a lot of organizations would go out of business. So most, most organizations and, and, you know, with minor variations say that you should probably spend about 70% of your your time and resources on your performance engine, your main business that's actually making you money. You should then spend about 20% of your time and resources on incremental improvements to that business. So there's the incremental innovation. And then about 10% of your resources on the disruptive innovation, the completely new ideas. Uh, now the Coca-Cola firm, for example, they call that uh, those three phases, if you like, or three parts, they call the 70% the now, they call the 70%, uh, sorry, the 20%, they call the next, and they call the 10% the new. So so that 70-20-10 ratio is, is a good one. 70% on your current business, 20% on improving it, and 10% on the completely new ideas. Thank you, Dr. David. We have another one, and it is how do you make your workforce innovative? Okay, well, it's, it's very similar to um, the answer about creativity. And it comes down to managing those four Ps. So if you want a creative, uh, sorry, an innovative workforce, you have to have individual people who are motivated, who are willing to take risks, who, who understand that part of their job is being innovative. You also have to have those people who've got the right sort of skill set to be innovative. And in fact, that's not just teaching them brainstorming and divergent thinking, but they also have to be technically good at their jobs. So you have to have both the convergent skills of, of you know, uh, job knowledge, as well as the creative skills of divergent thinking. They have to operate in a favorable in, and supportive environment. And they also have to be able to recognize when they've come up with innovative ideas. So to get a creative workforce, you need to manage all four of those Ps and they all interact with each other. So you can't ignore any one of the Ps, but if you manage all four of those Ps together as a system, then you have the ability to move your organization towards stronger and stronger innovation. Thank you, Dr. David. The other question is, what is the biggest barrier to creativity at work? Good question again. The, probably the biggest barrier um, is an unfavorable organizational culture. And the work I do with I2P, uh, where we, we do this measurement of, of uh, organizations uh, along the lines that I was describing, that's probably the consistently the weakest area that we see when we do the diagnosis. In other words, it's the area where we see the most red on, on that colored diagram. Uh, and that's an unfavorable environment. What we find is that in a lot of organizations, the people are actually highly motivated. They want to be creative and they have pretty good thinking skills and so on. They, they can think divergently and they're good at their jobs. But the thing that's holding them back is the organizational climate, that they're not allowed to be innovative or they don't have sufficient resources or time or the company as a whole doesn't sort of see the value of innovation. 
So I'd say the, the, the biggest impediment to innovation in organizations usually seems to be the organizational culture or climate in the organization. Thank you, Dr. David. We have another one and it is, in an aging workforce, there will be resistance to change and innovation because of fear of job loss. No willingness to change people might be risk averse, etc. Any tips on how this can be managed? Well, I, again, very good question. Uh, I think that the, the way that we have to manage that, and it's, it's legitimate concern. And of course, um, you know, we have to recognize that uh, you know, we're not always talking about ideal situations, but there are real world pressures. Uh, I think the most powerful uh, way that we can address that sort of situation remains a good organizational culture. And in particular, the message coming down from the leadership in the organization that, you know, giving, giving employees permission to, to be more innovative and, and demonstrating that, that the leadership means that. So it's not just a nice thing to say, but, but demonstrating through the way that the leadership behaves, through the support that they provide, which might also include, you know, things like uh, reskilling older mm -hmm. workers and things like that. But, but organizational culture, climate management style is, remains probably the single biggest factor in sending the right message, especially for older workers who may be more risk averse, but sending a, you know, you've got to send a powerful message that it's okay to do these things and that you will be supported if you do them so that people uh, you know, become comfortable with taking risks. Thank you, Dr. David. We have another one and it is, what are your experiences about innovation? Uh, well, uh, I guess mine um, are, because I work in an engineering school and so on, of course, they you know they tend to be aligned more to to probably you know, products and systems rather than services and so on but um, I mean it's in in general terms uh, you know I think it's very exciting to look around in the world and see just how much is being done by organizations uh, you know to to find new solutions to problems and it makes me actually very optimistic that you know even with problems of climate change and you know economic crises and things like that that most organizations and most people are remarkably good at finding new solutions to problems uh and 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 there's a lot of people in a lot of organizations who are willing to take risks and so on so uh, you know my my experience is that that it's it's pretty optimistic that uh, there's a lot going on there's a lot of really neat little examples of, of very clever solutions to problems that make a big difference. So one of uh, that I was going to mention um, before was that uh, one of the parcel delivery companies, I think it's FedEx, a few years ago, uh, they wanted to reduce the amount of fuel that their delivery trucks were using just in the United States. And so they have thousands of these trucks that spend all day driving around cities delivering parcels to people. And somebody in that organization realized that if you stopped the trucks uh, sitting at, at traffic intersections waiting to turn across the traffic, if you could eliminate that, then you could save huge amounts of fuel and also save on you know, emissions and so on. And so somebody came up with the idea of reprogramming the GPS systems that they use in their trucks simply to avoid turning across traffic and therefore sitting at intersections with the engine running and waiting. And when they did that, they found that they saved you know, millions of gallons of fuel. Now I know that probably people in Saudi Arabia don't like to hear that because you, you know, you, you, uh, your economy is very, uh, oil is very important there. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's a kind of clever, interesting solution uh, to a problem. And you see all sorts of things like that every day uh, you know, around us. So my experience is that that innovation is happening everywhere, and sometimes we don't even sort of realise that it's happening. But when you look carefully, we see innovation happening all over the place in all sorts of industries and sectors uh, all around us. Thank you, Dr. David. We have time for one last question before we come to an end, and actually, that's two question. One is how do I encourage yep. innovation in my organisation? And how do I spot opportunities for innovation? Okay, the, the first one, how to encourage it. Uh, 
uh, you, you're not going to be surprised to hear me say it's it's basically the same thing that we have to to look at those four P's. But perhaps uh, the the question is also um, you know driving at the fact like if you're an individual manager, say at some level in your organisation, and you've recognised the importance of innovation, <clears throat> then how do you how do you convey that importance to other people in your organization how do you convince your boss other leaders in the organization to to make the same move towards innovation um, and i think i mean one of the the first ways that we need to do that is is of course to start sharing and emphasizing the importance and and the value that innovation can deliver us <clears throat> It's also, I guess, what that represents is is that even as a manager in the organization, you're not just managing the people below you to help them be innovative, which I've already talked about, but you're also managing up. You're managing your bosses and your boss's boss and perhaps helping them in, in that case. You're not trying to teach them you know, how to brainstorm and so on, but you're trying to, to help them understand the value of innovation. And in any organization, to make innovation happen, you also need champions. You need people who are, who are the the kind of, the the leaders of innovation, who who promote it and who talk about it and who share the benefits of innovation. Uh, so it's a, a matter of managing down, but also man, managing up. Uh, and the the final one was how to spot uh, innovation. I think again a very good question. Um, <clears throat> to me, it's not it's not a question of spotting innovation but it's a question of spotting problems in particular so you know go back to that i think very first slide of mine about change driving market pull so for for a lot of organizations the 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 sequence of events tends to be that they identify a problem and then they develop a solution some organizations also develop solutions and then look for a market but in either case the the spotting innovation is really a question of spotting problems and saying, well, there's a problem that we could solve and then embarking on the process of generating solutions. Or it's recognizing when your organization has actually developed a new solution and then you know, spotting a way to apply that. So I, I break that question down slightly further that spotting innovation is about spotting problems and spotting new solutions. And that means you've got to be able to, to identify when something is novel and when it works, you've also got to be able to identify when you, you actually see a new customer demand and, and doing those two things, then the innovation follows naturally from that. Thank you, Dr. David. Uh, we have two more before we end this session. I just missed out these questions. I wanted to ask you is yeah, that's okay. how to build a network of innovation champions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, also, very good. I, I have. Uh, I'm also doing some work with a company in Norway at the moment, and uh, they're a food manufacturer. And one of the, they have a, a very similar problem to that. That one of the things they're trying to do is uh, to create this this sort of uh, network of people of champions, as the, the questioner pointed out, within the organisation. Uh, now, what they're doing is is their approach is um, that they're they're basically this, so they have an innovation manager, and her job is to to kind of identify people with the kinds of qualities that I've been talking about. So people who themselves are are innovative people who have the right motivation and personal qualities, and to identify a person like that in the major work areas of the organisation, and then to to uh, to kind of uh, approach those people and give them some resources and time and, and training and so on that they need to then start sort of permeating the message of, of innovation out in the organization. But their starting point, their approach is to find the people who themselves are, you know, are, are likely to be the best at innovation because they have the right personal qualities and so on and then turn them into to little innovation champions with some resources and some support. And what I think happens is that as, as you get more people like that in the organization, then you reach a kind of tipping point in the organization where, you know, as more and more people start to, to kind of develop those attitudes and skills, 
you reach a point where it becomes the culture of the organization. So you have to start small with some key people and, and give them the time and resources and also send them out to do the same thing to other people to help sort of convert other people and develop other people. Thank you, Dr. David. One last one, uh, and that is, yep. can you provide an example of an organization with the ideal culture suited for innovation? Google, for example. Okay, it's again a very good question. Uh, the the danger with trying to do this is that every organization is different in the sense that every organization is dealing with slightly different kinds of problems or, or sometimes very different problems. But also, you know, no two organizations are starting the process uh, in, in an identical fashion. So you can, you can take an example like Google. And, you know, it's great if, if you are running an organization that, that is making billions of dollars. But if you tried to, to take what works for Google and put that in a small organization of 10 people, it would probably fail because the, the organizations are just too different. Now, even if you compare a Google to an Apple, so two large technology organizations, very wealthy organizations, even comparing what one does with the other, you know, it, what works in Google won't necessarily work in Apple or vice versa because you've got different combinations of people with different strengths. You've got different markets, different starting conditions. So now I'm not trying to avoid the answer, but the, uh, the question, but the key here really goes back to the, the final uh, point I made about diagnosing the organization. You really need to understand any given organization's individual profile of where its strengths and weaknesses lie. And then once you understand that, then you can tailor uh, a kind of innovation plan for that organization that will work for that organization because it's recognized and it's, it's, uh, it's kind of tailored to and aligned to that particular organization's purpose, uh, their conditions, their starting strengths and weaknesses and so on. So it, it, my, my view is that because every organization is, is different in some way that you've got to, you've got to drill down, you've got to measure the organization and tailor, tailor the, the kind of approach to innovation for each organization. Thank you, Dr. David. That, folks, that brings us towards the end of this webinar. Well, any concluding remarks from your side, Dr. David, before we end the session? No, no, I'm uh, only that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry we didn't have a little bit more time. Uh, I always get kind of carried away and, and you know, want to talk for far too long uh, on these subjects. But I hope that everybody's got a little bit of an introduction from the questions that you've asked. It's clear that, you know, everybody listening has a good concept of innovation. I hope I've added some useful uh, knowledge to that discussion, maybe some of the things about the, the personal qualities and you know the organizational press that you weren't aware of. And I hope also in particular that, uh, that you've got the message that it's possible to measure these things, um, both you know, the individual things and also to measure the organization as a whole. To, to, and once you've got that measure, then you're in a position to start improving the organization. But until you've measured things, you don't know where the strengths and weaknesses are. So I, I hope you found it interesting. Uh, if anybody's got you know, more detailed questions, you're welcome to get in touch with me. You can you know, Google me and you'll, you'll find my name and contact details or through uh, GBNTC. Have a look at the book and so on. But you know, please get in touch uh, if you think we can help you with your innovation. So shukran and thank you very much. Shukran. Thank you very much, Dr. David. Once again, I really want to thank you on behalf of Gulf Business Network Training Center for your valuable time and sharing valuable information with us. And thank you all of those who have attended this webinar. We are recording this webinar and it will be uploaded on a website. So please stay tuned to webinar.gbntc.com for updates or for downloading the soft copy of this presentation. With that, I'd like to end this webinar and you all will be automatically dismissed once this session ends. Thank you very much and you all have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Take care. Take care. Right. Thanks for it. Okay, you too. Bye.